Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts and prey, of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now that's uh, the text we're in this morning. and We're in a year-long study of the book of Acts, the story of the church, really our story. And before we get into unpacking that text and that part of the story, let me just as a way of introduction talk to you about what I think the, the, the subject matter is of this text, what it's saying to us. And as a pastor, uh, part of my role is to meet with uh, individuals and couples sometimes, premarital counseling and marriage counseling and talking about the difficulties and struggles in marriages. Um, I remember meeting with one young couple who'd been married about a year, a little bit less, and they were having some issues, and the young man said to me in a private meeting, he has to meet with me separate from his, his new bride, he said, you know, I'm just, I'm just struggling with how it's going. And I said, what do you mean? He says, it's just really hard. And I looked at him like, yeah? And he said, you know, I, I just don't believe a marriage that's meant to be should be this hard. Some of you are chuckling. And those of you who are chuckling, I'm guessing you've been married for a while. And I asked him, well, well who told you that it's, marriage isn't supposed to be easy? Where did you get the idea that it shouldn't be hard? He sort of shrugged and said, well, isn't that right? And we met a few times uh, and, uh, after this, and it became clear to me that the primary issue in his marriage, and they had issues, but we all do, the primary issue in his marriage was his own false expectations about how it ought to be. His issue was not his wife, was not their circumstances, were not the things they fought about. His big issue was the ideas in his head of how it's supposed to be. That was what was in the way. And I tried to explain that to him and show that to him. And, you know, I see the same dynamic at play in our relationship with God. We all come to the Christian life with some wrong thinking. We all have some wrong ideas about how it's supposed to be. What God ought to be like. How God ought to act in my life. What he should do. What we think he's like. Not all of our ideas are all wrong, but at best they're incomplete. At worst they're misguided. And part of what it means to grow in our Christian life is to have God change our thinking about who he is and how he works in the world. Colossians 1.10, the Apostle Paul says, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. At the end of that verse, he says, increasing in the knowledge of God, growing in, some translations say. How do you grow? Well, part of growing in the knowledge of God is growing out of some wrong thinking about him and growing into some right thinking about him, letting go of our ideas. C.S. Lewis writes about this, as he does about many things. And he writes uh, in a, a phrase in his book, A Grief Observed, called, God is the Great Iconoclast. Anybody know what an iconoclast is? The word iconoclast means one who smashes or breaks idols. But what is he talking about? Lewis wrote this book, A Grief Observed, uh, in his, the wake of his, him dealing with the tragedy of the death of his wife to cancer. Why didn't God save her? Why didn't God heal her? I thought he would wrestling with this. He says, I had built 
idols out of my ideas about how God should operate. And God had to break those idols of my ideas to show me more of himself. And that's often painful. He writes, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered time after time. He shatters it himself. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his loving presence? We all have our ideas about what God's like. Often our ideas are misguided and wrong, but we cling to them, making idols out of them. And God, in his mercy, comes to us and smashes the idols we build of our own ideas. Sometimes that's painful for us, so he can give us more of himself. And quite frankly, that's what's going on here in Acts 10 and Acts 11. We'll get to that in a moment. Another author, A.W. Tozer, he has two initials for a first name, so you know that he's smart. In the introduction to his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, has a fascinating portion that's, that's been profound for me and for many others. He writes, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always the question of God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend, by a secret law of the soul, to move toward our mental image of God. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. They're saying the same thing. And in fact, that's what's happening here for Peter and through Peter for the church. We've already seen, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, how God changed the thinking of the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10. Let's go in your Bible. It's not on the screen, but Acts 10, verses 34 and 35. You have your Bible. You can turn there with me. This is the crux of the lesson Peter learned. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, your text might say favoritism, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That's the, that's the new lesson for Peter. Something he didn't understand fully before, now he gets it. And God's going to use what happened to Peter to change the whole church. You see, our wrong thinking can get in the way of our worship and of our work for God if we're not careful. So Acts 10 is the account of how God changes them thinking, uh, the ideas of Peter. And then that account is essentially repeated in Acts chapter 11. Now when you look through commentaries, and sometimes even in churches who preach through Acts, they'll often skip over chapter 11, because chapter 11 is a repeating of chapter 10. So let's just go right to 12, we already learned that lesson. I think that's a mistake. Remember, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he wrote it not with, uh, you know, he didn't have like... He couldn't cut and paste on his MacBook Pro. He's writing on a papyrus scroll. Space is a premium. He repeats the story for a reason. Whenever you see something in the Bible repeated, you should pay attention to that. This is a critical lesson for the church. It's, it's really a crossroads in the early church. They have to get this right. And it's repeated so that they do, and I think for us as well. And that's why we're going to spend some time focusing on it. It's easy for us to miss. God is going to use what happened here to Peter to wake up, open the eyes of, and change the thinking of the whole church. And remember, the church, the center of the church right now is in Jerusalem. Look at verses 44 through 48 of Acts chapter 10, before we get to 11 here. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now this little account here in the verses I just read, scholars sometimes refer to this as the Gentile Pentecost. Let's go back and review. Uh, if you were here in the early part of the fall, in Acts chapter 2, we studied Pentecost. Pentecost was a Jewish festival. Jerusalem was full of visitors for the festival. At that moment, 120 Christians, that's all there was in the world, were gathered in an upper room, and the Spirit of God falls on them in power, and they speak the wonders of God in other tongues. A sign that the Holy Spirit had come to them. Sort of the, the spark that ignited the movement called the church. Now here in Acts 10, we see a very similar thing happening not to Jews, that's critical, but to Gentiles. This blows Peter's mind. We'll get to why that was in a few moments. They received the Spirit in exactly the same way the Jews did as a mark that God had brought them too into the family. 
into the church. Now, a a few words about the Holy Spirit and this tongues thing before we move on. Sometimes I think this is an issue of debate. We get this wrong at times. The Holy Spirit is not a reward for good living, for right practice. It's not a mark of some super spirituality. The Holy Spirit is a gift God gives to those who trust in him by faith in his son Jesus. It's all believers receive the Spirit. In the New Testament, we see at times the Spirit, the manifestation is speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. It's not all the time. In Paul's conversion in Acts 9, a few weeks ago we studied that, we have no mention that Paul spoke in tongues when he received the Spirit. doesn't mean he didn't. We just aren't told that he did. We don't know. And in Acts chapter 2, and Peter, in verse 38, gives the speech and says, if you, want to, if you want to be saved, repent and be baptized. He doesn't mention the speaking in tongues. The point is this. It is entirely possible and common and, pra- and practiced for people to repent of their sin, be forgiven by Christ, receive the Spirit, but not speak in tongues. Which is not to say it doesn't happen today. Paul later says, do all speak in tongues? The implication would be, no, all don't. The point here is a person can believe in Jesus and receive the Spirit without speaking in tongues. The reason we see it here in Acts 10 the same way in Acts 2 is a very specific reason to teach the church a very specific lesson. So let's look how this plays out. How does the gospel change our thinking? So we all come to God with some wrong thinking. We all bring some wrong thinking into our relationship with God. God wants to change our wrong thinking so we can be used by him for his redemptive purposes. Let's look then at how God does that. How does God change our thinking? First of all, as we earnestly seek him, as we earnestly seek him, go back in Acts chapter 10, verse 9, flip in your Bibles. This is how the whole thing, this whole account we've been studying, kicks off. Peter and Cornelius is, the, is this, this encounter before they even meet each other. Verse 9, the next day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Why is that interesting? Peter goes up at the sixth hour, that's about noon, on on the rooftop to pray. Why? He's not looking for a special revelation. He's not seeking some new vision of how things are supposed to go. He's doing what he always did, setting aside time to seek God in prayer. That's where he receives his vision. That's where this whole encounter that God uses to blow the minds of the church begins, through one man praying on his own. If if it's true that we all come to God with some wrong thinking, and if it's true that God wants to change our wrong thinking so we can be more useful to him and experience more of him, how's he going to do that if we don't seek him? If you want to grow in your knowledge of God, how's that going to happen if you don't read his word and you don't seek him in prayer? 1,800 of us in our church family are in the all-time bestseller book club, some form or another, reading the New Testament through together as a church family. I'm hearing lots of stories of people who have read the Bible many times and who have never read it before, how their minds are being opened to hear it in a fresh way. I hope that's many of you. It's not too late to join in. But if you want to grow in your knowledge of God and have your wrong ideas reshaped, how is that possibly going to happen if you don't earnestly seek him on your own? If you set aside no time to study his word and to pray, I think you get stuck in your wrong ideas if that's the case. So the first way this happens is... When we, when we individually seek God. Second, and this is a big one, by making us uncomfortable. By making us uncomfortable. It would not have taken long for word to spread back to Jerusalem about what happened in Caesarea and in Joppa with Peter. Those were less than a day's journey from Jerusalem. And remember, the center of Christianity was in the city of Jerusalem still at this time. That's where most of the apostles still were. That's where the whole thing started. That's where the leaders of this movement resided. That's going to change in a few chapters, and it spreads to Antioch and then to Rome and beyond. But for now, it's still a, it's still a Jewish movement centered in Jerusalem. It would not have taken long for word to get back to them about this Gentile conversion. Now, why would that be shocking? Let's read verses 11, or chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 again. And we'll get a little sense of what's going on here. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, not the best name for your group, I don't think. It's not actually a party. Criticized him saying, you went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, what's that all about? 
News spreads about this, what happened. And Peter's being criticized and questioned and challenged about this. Now, the important thing to remember here is that up to this point, the movement of the church was primarily a Jewish movement. We have the Samaritan revival in Acts chapter 4 and 5, and that's really uh, sort of an exception. Jesus had already been a Samaritan and preached there. Samaritans were sort of half-breeds, half-Jews. And then we, so that's, that's one place where it was not a non-Jewish movement, but that was like an exception that God did through the persecution. And then we have the isolated account of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 6. Other than that, the church has been spreading by the gospel being preached to Jews outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is the Messiah. They're hearing that the Messiah has come, and they're coming to faith in Christ. It's a Jewish movement with a Jewish center in Jerusalem, with Jewish con- converted leaders. It's hard for us to get our minds around this, exactly. The Greek word for Gentiles is a Greek word, ethne. It's where we get our English word, ethnic. It's sometimes translated nations. It literally means everybody who's not a Jew. To the Jewish mind, the world was divided quite literally into two halves, Jews and everybody else, right? There's us and there's them. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. There's those that are in the family of God and those that are not. And there was no fuzziness about this. So even though they've come to faith in Christ, they still see the world through a Jewish lens. They don't understand what God is fully up to here just yet. For 2,000 years, the children of Israel have been God's chosen people. Now, because of Jesus, just anybody can come in? Is that how this works? Remember, the first Christians were converted Jews. And the first church is in Jerusalem. And the center is still there. Was the Messiah really a Gentile Messiah too? Can just anybody repent of their sin, profess faith, and be in? Well, we would say, yes, yes, of course. But that was a big issue for them. That's why the story is repeated. This is a crossroads. What if they get this wrong? What if they define this wrong? Talk about barriers to the gospel. This is crucial. And I'm sure Peter knew he's going to be challenged. He knew he's going to be called to account on this one. The circumcision party. Again, not the best name if you want to like spread your movement. Um, these were strict legalists. So inside of, of, of the, the church movement in Jerusalem, you've got converted Jews who just in general don't understand what God is up to and are nervous about all these Gentiles coming to faith. And then you have a strict legalistic grouping. Later, Paul will refer to these people as the Judaizers. Here's what they're, essentially they believed. Yes, Jesus can save anybody, but the path to salvation is from the Jews and through the Jews. So to receive Jesus, first you've got to become a Jew. Then you can receive the Messiah. And the mark of, Jewish, of the covenant for a Jewish male was circumcision. That's why they're called the circumcision party. woo This is a very, very significant moment in the church. Close to a division. In fact, in Acts 15, in a few weeks, we'll see the church has to meet again on this issue and have a whole council to get this one right. I think, one, as an aside, one of the things this teaches us is that even in the first decade of the church, we still got things wrong. We still struggled. God still had to redirect us. It wasn't all smooth sailing. It never has been. But God, in his mercy, is always there, always moving, always redirecting if we're open. So this is a crucial moment here. Notice the specific accusation against Peter. Verse 3. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. (gasps) You know? Now why would that be a big deal, eating with them? In the ancient Eastern culture, and even in our culture, in the Eastern culture still today, to sit down at a table and break bread with someone was the ultimate symbol of, I accept you. We're together. We're on equal footing. I accept your way of life and and you into my life. That was a big deal. In fact, you remember what Jesus got accused of by the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law in Mark chapter 2? They say, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners and those outside the family of God? How dare he? You see, for a faithful Orthodox Jewish man to enter the home of a Gentile, to sit at a Gentile's table, to eat a Gentile's food was unthinkable. They're unclean. They're outside the family of God. You just did not do that. It's hard for us to grasp that. But that was just a complete no-no. And Peter, an apostle, is doing this. That's why they criticize him. This brings us to the, the third way the gospel changes our thinking. 
First, first of course, when we earnestly seek him, God, speak, God can work in our lives when we're open. And we're open when we're, we're seeking him. Second, God can work in our lives through discomfort, pain. It's not easy. And third, through his word. Now, Peter is defending here to the Jews and explaining what happened. And listen to the way he recounts it in verses 16 and 17 <coughs> Excuse me, of the text. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? It's an amazing passage. So let me remind you what's happening here. Peter, because of a vision and a dream and some messengers that, that, that were sent by God through Cornelius to, to bring him to Joppa, he shows up at this guy's house and the, the people from the town are gathered in. They're not, they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. Peter proclaims the gospel. He's preaching to them the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. While doing that, they're moved in their hearts, they repent of their sin, they receive forgiveness, and the Spirit falls on them, and they start speaking in tongues. This blows Peter's mind. And in that moment... Peter remembers the word of the Lord. Like he, I imagine him hearing the voice of Jesus in his head. How he said, John baptized with water, but you'll baptize the Holy Spirit and with fire. And all of a sudden, it clicks. Oh, this is what he meant. It's, this is what he was talking about. I didn't get it then, like a lot of things he said. But I do now. You ever have that experience? You ever come across a portion of the Bible or a verse or a, that you've heard read, you've heard preached on, you've seen on postcards or Christian greeting cards a hundred or a thousand times. And for whatever reason, this time, it hits you in a way you never saw it before. Ever happened to you? It has for me. Why does that happen? Well, because we're much smarter now. No. The word hasn't changed. It's always been there. What changed? We did. Maybe we've been through some pain in our life. Maybe we've had some struggle where we're, we're, our circumstances are causing us to ask different questions now. For whatever reason, we're open in a way we weren't before, and now God shows us the depth of the truth of his word. Oh, now I understand what he's talking about. That's happening for Peter. And if this can happen for Peter, a man who walked personally, physically on earth with Jesus, heard him audibly preach, saw him perform miracles. If Peter can have some wrong ideas and have to have his thinking realigned, then you're kidding yourself if you think you don't, if we think we don't. Peter hears the word. He gets it. And he says, essentially, who am I to get in the way? How dare I stand in the way now that I understand what's going on here? That's what's happening here. You know, there's a sense in which Peter's saying, his defense of his, of his actions. They're criticizing him, right, for eating with Gentiles. For, what are you doing here, Peter? This is outside the way we think. This is not how we think God should operate. This is not the way the movement's supposed to go. You're not supposed to be just letting anybody in like this. And Peter's defense is essentially, look, if you don't like it, take it up with God. He's the one who did this. And he's the one who said this. And if you have a problem, it's not with me. It's with him. Because I didn't do this. God did. I think this happens in our lives as individuals and in the church in profound ways. To use an illustration from C.S. Lewis again, I know I haven't quoted him in a while, I figure I'd just cram them all in in one sermon. He wrote an essay called Talking About Bicycles. Lewis never learned to drive a car. He crashed once while trying, everybody agreed that's a bad idea, so he just rode his bike around Oxford as an Oxford professor in Cambridge, and you see him in his tweed jacket just pedaling around Oxford. And he said when he was a young child, he was unenchanted with bicycles. He didn't even know about them. Then comes the point when you learn to ride for the first time. Remember when you learned to ride a bike for the first time? Do you remember back that far? It's, 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 like you've, it's like a milestone in your life, right? It's freeing. It's fun. I remember teaching Noah to ride a bike. I, I was all prepared. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be a good dad. I'm going to do this. We went down the street, you know, and on the driveway. I took the training wheels off, and I was walking next to him. He's like, get off, Dad. Get off there, Dad. And he pedaled down the, the sidewalk, turned around the driveway, pedaled back and stopped. And he goes, I did it. And I thought, I'm a great teacher. <laughs> he knocked his tooth later, but. But, you know, then, then, and then he wanted to ride every moment of every day. Remember that? Your kids, when they learn to ride, they just want to ride constantly. We, we had a fire uh, hydrant at the end of our street. It was, he called it the fire extinguisher. Can I go to the fire extinguisher and back? Because in his little brain, that was at like the end of the universe. He could still see our house. He'd just ride back and forth all day long. He loved it. 
And then he gets to be an adolescent. And riding your bike is not so cool anymore. So you go from unenchanted to enchanted. You love riding a bike. And then you go to disenchanted, meaning it's not cool, you don't love it, it's not fun. You'd rather be with one of your buddies in their car if your mom will drive you. You don't want to ride anymore. You know, you go through those stages, right? Lewis said he has come to the place of re-enchantment with bike riding. As an, as an older man, he rediscovered the joy that he'd lost as a child. He loved it again, the same way he did as a boy. And he said he loved it actually better for having gone through the disenchantment. Here's what that is even about as it relates to our text. Lewis says, and I think he's right, we go through this in our spiritual lives as well. Disenchantment, reenchantment. There's a moment in your life when you don't know much about God at all. You're unenchanted. And then you discover the gospel at age 6, at age 60, or somewhere in between. You find out that God loves you with an everlasting love, that he died to forgive your sin, that he wants to adopt you into his family, that he has plans for your life for eternity. And you're enchanted with this, God who loves you. But inevitably, we go through periods of disenchantment, don't we? We experience some loss. Life gets hard. Some disappointment and pain. Something calls into question God's love. And we don't feel as, as enchanted with him. We don't feel as close to him as we used to. And we grow cold in our relationship with God. But Lewis says that's actually the way sometimes we come back around to re-enchantment. We rediscover the joy we lost. And his point is you love him better and more fully for having gone through that pain than if you'd never, if you'd never had. I think that's what's happening here for the church. They have their way of thinking how it's supposed to be. And God is shattering the idols of their ideas. And it's painful and it's confusing and it's causing unrest. But it's good. It's good. I, the, the critical question here for the church then and for us now is the same. Are we going to move forward with the gospel or are, going to be, are we going to retreat to what is familiar and comfortable for us? That was their issue, right? Are we going to move forward, even though it's scary, we're not sure what God is doing with all these Gentiles coming to faith, and how are we going to manage this? Or are we going to back up and retreat into safe, familiar, comfortable Judaism and legalism? What's it for us today? Are we, FBCG, this part of God's community in the world, going to move forward with what he's doing, even though it might ask, cost us something, even though it might be a little uncomfortable for many of us? Or are we going to retreat into becoming a comfortable, sleepy, you know, everybody's okay, suburban church? I think you know what God wants for you. I'm so glad the church in Acts didn't do that because we would not be here if they had. It's the same issue for you as an individual and for us as his body. Are we going to move forward where he leads us, even though it's a little bit scary and uncomfortable? Or are we going to retreat into familiarity and comfortability? I hope and I pray that we move forward together. Will you stand with me for closing prayer? There's not a closing song this morning, so after I pray, if you'd like someone to pray with you personally, feel free to come forward. Members of the prayer team will be down here. And for those of you that can help us stack the chairs, we appreciate that. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for your grace poured out on us through Jesus. Thank you that you have been and still are breaking the false notions we have about you. Open our eyes to who you are and what you are doing. Give us the courage by your spirit to move forward wherever you lead. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said, amen. And go in peace.